Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, this is the uh, last lecture in our uh, summer uh, session. And uh, uh, with the exam is planned for this coming Friday in the same format as the previous two exams. So please be aware of it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm still waiting for the co-hosts so that they can manage the admitting process, but uh, I think I don't want to lose time, so we'll get started right away. Uh, <clears throat> sharing uh, today what uh, we are going to cover uh, is uh, uh, the rest of the chapters on uh, space uh, 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 nuclear uh, energy applications. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I'll leave, uh, we'll cover probably two chapters, but I'll leave the rest of the reading for you to uh, ponder uh, yourselves. Uh, humans have uh, been interested in space applications of nuclear energy uh, since the beginning of the nuclear age, starting with the uh, Enrico Fermi, which we all know from the first lecture, uh, built and operated the first reactor, the Chicago pile number one. Uh, but uh, we uh, know that in the summer of 1950, over lunch with colleagues, uh, Enrico Fermi uh, made some comment about the existence of alien life. And uh, he, he's quoted to have said, don't you ever wonder where everybody is? And uh, this became known as a Fermi uh, paradox that we covered earlier in the first chapter. And here in the last lecture, we come back to it uh, uh, again. Uh, Earth is uh, 4.6 billion years old, as we know, uh, resulting from a supernova explosion, a cataclysmic event where a star collapsed upon itself, forming the uh, rocky planets, Earth, Mars, and uh, the, uh, and the uh, uh, other uh, uh, solid or rocky planets, if you want to call it. And, <clears throat> and uh, in that case, uh, uh, the universe itself, the farthest uh, light that you can see coming to us from other galaxies is uh, aged uh, according to the theory of the Big Bang 13.7 uh, billion uh, year uh, ago. So I have to go back here and uh, uh, get help from the co-host. So I'll stop share temporarily. And uh, participants, Alvaro, uh, make co-host here. All right, Alvaro, please take over the admitting process. I will share the screen again. <clears throat> So the idea of the existing of uh, other forms of uh, life uh, in the universe is a debatable uh, issue. And uh, uh, the question uh, 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 to answer Mr. Fermi's paradox have been tried by many cosmologists and scientists. Uh, some people suggested uh, that maybe there is a great filter, quote unquote, that limits the continuous existence of other forms of technological civilization. Uh, this is a pessimistic view. Uh, the optimistic view is that, well, we are a technological civilization. We are here. Uh, maybe nobody else survived to our state of technology. Uh, the filter may be behind us, and uh, nobody is there to show us the path. So in that case, it in is incumbent on human civilization uh, to blaze a trail, uh, and uh, as maybe we are too early in the age of the universe, it is our destiny to lend a helping hand to those who follow us. Uh, we know that there can be life elsewhere, but not necessarily in the form of uh, uh, what we have as uh, humans. And uh, uh, <clears throat> one cannot dismiss the possibility that uh, our galaxy may be the site of artifacts and relics of uh, numerous long dead planetary technological civilizations. So it's incumbent for us uh, in our interest in space 
uh, <clears throat> to create a Noah's Ark uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we have uh, we would have some kind of a replica or a, uh, a, a storage uh, uh, a way of preserving life on Earth because we know that one of those filters could be the uh, 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 an asteroid or a comet basically causing a mass extinction on Earth. Hence the interest on, uh, of humans on establishing a base on the moon, uh, which is a current uh, goal of NASA in the United States. And uh, <clears throat> uh, some individuals are even uh, suggesting uh, 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 private companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin uh, they can mine the asteroids, which contain about $20, 20 trillion dollars uh, uh, of uh, maybe of uh, uh, of uh, minerals and uh, even water. So it can be uh, also uh, some kind of uh, uh, colonized uh, uh, in general. A large amount of chemical energy is uh, used today in space travel. We haven't evolved into using nuclear. Uh, uh, energy, which, uh, however, we know that uh, uh, nuclear energy can provide us with a very high specific impulse. We'll define that as we go uh, along. Uh, however, progress uh, has been great, like the Saturn uh, V rocket that was the basis of the Apollo program for uh, trips to uh, the moon, uh, used the energy of about 1 million uh, engines of, for cars in general. Uh, when rockets are designed, they're created when, with one specific range in mind that takes uh, into account the fuel needed to travel and velocity available in general. All right, so let's see the uh, uh, limitations of uh, our using uh, rockets. As I suggested, the, the first goal for space colonization or spreading life in the rest of the universe is uh, our moon. Uh, it's, uh, it has been reached already in the Apollo missions. And uh, uh, it, even though it has no atmosphere, we still uh, it could be the base in terms of space travel, uh, since this is the farthest away that humans have set uh, their feet. Uh, following it, uh, the goal is to establish a base on Mars and uh, also NASA and uh, now individual private companies are looking into it. Uh, what is uh, uh, really uh, uh, very interesting is uh, that picture taken by uh, one of the astronauts from his spaceship uh, of the Earth from uh, 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 his vicinity when he was orbiting uh, the moon. So the Earth appears as a very beautiful bluish pearl uh, in space. So before uh, we even think about colonizing space, we need to be able to preserve our uh, wonderful Earth uh, here uh, under our feet. Uh, the Apollo missions uh, were the farthest uh, away that humans have set their feet, so to say, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the universe. And uh, uh, you notice here this, uh, a uh, uh, picture from the Apollo space program, man landing on the moon, notice because there is no uh, atmosphere on the moon, they had to have to set the flag with a, some kind of a stick to keep it uh, expanded here. Uh, uh, not uh, very well known that there were basically six moon landings only uh, uh, on the moon uh, in several missions, Apollo 11, Apollo 12, Apollo uh, 14, 15, 16, uh, 17 was the uh, last uh, mission to the moon in 1972. Uh, the plan is to go back to uh, the moon and the interest is not just in the, by the United States but by other uh, uh, industrial nations uh, uh, to mention Japan for instance and China in that case. So that is the farthest away that uh, 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 humans have uh, traveled in, uh, in in their own body in the rest of the universe. This is a picture of a moon print on the surface of the moon. Notice that uh, it's uh, has uh, it's uh, has is covered by dust, 
Uh, and it has a huge resource. In fact, it has uh, uh, large amounts of helium-3. And I suggested that with deuterium and helium-3, if we mine helium-3 from the moon, we can provide tremendous amounts of energy uh, for uh, the Earth uh, itself. Uh, getting uh, humans into space depends on the technology that is used. And it depends on uh, the x-axis here, the length of the mission that uh, we are trying to undergo. Uh, and uh, the, if you consider the power that we need for space missions, when the mission time is uh, short uh, uh, in the matter of days, uh, we know that combustion engines or chemical engines uh, allow us uh, to reach powers in the range of 300 maybe uh, kilowatt or three, uh, 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 <clears throat> and uh, rocketry in general, uh, you'll find that uh, mission times in the days uh, are fine with batteries, uh, fuel cells. Fuel cells, of course, uh, uh, use hydrogen, combine it with oxygen, and uh, you can use the combination as rocket fuel, but uh, you also can produce uh, electricity. Uh, when the mission time tries uh, starts reaching years, like to uh, missions to Saturn or to uh, uh, the nearest uh, other uh, planets, uh, there is no way uh, to provide energy for a long duration mission and uh, for a, uh, uh, a large amount of power than nuclear reactors. And we are not talking here about isotope generators, solar cells and isotope generators, they overlap the use for nuclear reactors, but when you need uh, large power on the y-axis here, uh, uh, the uh, 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 isotope generators using plutonium-238 or strontium-90 are not sufficient for space power. So nuclear reactor generators is the way for us to uh, establish not just propulsion uh, into the neighboring planets and other solar systems maybe, in the future of humanity, but uh, uh, also for bases on the moon or on uh, Mars. We'll try to discuss that in more detail. Uh, in terms of uh, our destiny as humans in space travel, you heard probably about uh, the SETI project, that's a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, it has been uh, uh, initiated and uh, run or uh, managed by uh, the American astronomer, Frank uh, Drake. And uh, from that perspective, uh, there is, uh, Drake wrote down a very interesting equation about the N, capital N here. This is the so-called Drake equation. Uh, he tried to uh, figure out the number, uh, the probable number of planets with Earth-like life and with a technological civilization in the known universe. So he simply went through the exercise of suggesting that that number of technological civilization would be equal to R star, which is the number of star systems, uh, multiplied into the probability of occurrence with stars with planets. Uh, when Drake wrote the equation, we didn't have information about star systems with planets. Now we know that uh, most star systems have, in fact, uh, planets. So we can even put in that piece of P as say probability of 0.9, maybe or 0.99. Uh, N sub E would be the fraction of planets that have habitable environments. So we are even finding today that some of them may have habitable environments, but different than what we have on Earth. The Goldilocks effects uh, in that case is when the temperature from the star uh, produces a heat environment that are not too hot like Venus or not too cold like Mars, uh, the Goldilocks temperature uh, is uh, the position of the planet away from uh, its sun, like on Earth, where water now becomes uh, in the liquid form and allows our form of life to uh, evolve. P sub L is the probability that life has originated on a given planet. Uh, P sub I is a life evolving into intelligence on the given planet, surviving other calamities or filters like asteroid impacts or volcanic uh, eruptions uh, uh, or pandemic maybe like we're living today or nuclear war, all of these events can be considered as filters that can end up the evolving of uh, 
evolution of civilization on a given planet. And uh, very importantly is capital L here, uh, uh, which is the longevity factor. Uh, some people suggest that technological, a technological civilization has uh, uh, produces the seeds of its own uh, destruction. And we see this in uh, uh, stupidity of uh, humans, in fact, uh, in uh, keeping the prospect of nuclear war uh, there available. And uh, we are under that umbrella right now, uh, uh, allowing uh, the destruction of their uh, uh, environment, uh, like in global warming, when the emission of uh, some gases can cause uh, uh, the destruction of the atmosphere of the Earth, uh, global climatic change. Uh, a third uh, uh, filter here that we are living is uh, the uh, gain of function uh, research, as I call it, that's really creating viruses and uh, 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 diseases that do not exist in uh, on Earth, uh, just uh, for the sake of money and fame and the destruction of other uh, humans of different species. So that is the gain of function research um, uh, suspected of creating the present pandemic. Uh, this is the equation as Mr. Drake wrote it. Uh, further research beyond the one he wrote it suggests other uh, factors that I'll show in a moment. Uh, but uh, the fascinating thing is that uh, uh, the Earth and uh, uh, our Sun are part of the large uh, galaxy. Uh, we are part of what's called the Sagittarius arm that is rotating uh, in space right here. Uh, the Sun would be uh, very close to the uh, Orion Nebula. So that may be uh, the closest sun system that we can reach in space uh, travel uh, for our descendants uh, in general. All right, so we, in that case, uh, you'll find that uh, the Drake equation uh, has been uh, suggested to be uh, modified by adding uh, a modified form of the Drake's equation here, where we also account for the probability of gamma rays burst, so surviving gamma rays burst. And this would add another probability P sub gamma here for uh, gamma rays burst probability. Uh, most dwarf stars like our sun are large enough to emit solar flares uh, that can reach Jupiter orbit and can in fact sterilize the surface of the earth. So that uh, implies another uh, factor. Uh, periodic mass extinctions uh, add P sub C as another probability. So there is a form uh, of the uh, Drake equation uh, uh, that modified it in terms of uh, probabilities. Uh, some people suggest, and uh, we concur with that, that uh, these probabilities uh, depend on random phenomena and actual observations. But in fact, we do not have data to estimate those probabilities. So in fact, we may be using possibilities rather than probabilities. And there is a body of theory a mathematical theory that would suggest that those probabilities are not really probabilities, but possibilities. Uh, in that case, the equation would be uh, an end a logical gate between uh, all these uh, possible events. So you write that the end prime as a modified the pos possible a possible number of planets or civilizations uh, as R star and sub E L, those factors come out, but that's all those probabilities here would be replaced by possibilities. And when you put in an end logical gate uh, in the uh, theory called fuzzy logic or possibility theory, it becomes a minimum of the possibilities of each one of those probabilities in that case. So in that case, uh, uh, this is a more plausible approach to the Drake's equation uh, in general. The only factor that we understand in uh, equations one uh, and two, or their two prime and one prime, is the R star. We have a good estimate uh, of how many star systems could be existing in our known universe. Uh, in fact, some people even suggest that there may be other universes, like each one of them, like a water. Uh, uh, bubbles in boiling water. Uh, in our known universe, uh, the suggestion is that our star is 100 
to 400 billion stars alone in our single galaxy. And there are many, many millions and billions uh, maybe of other uh, galaxies uh, there. So some people suggest that uh, 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 life could exist, in fact, uh, in other, uh, on other uh, solar systems in uh, other uh, places. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, it becomes a, a goal of humans to try uh, to explore these ideas. Uh, the human race is at risk from a series of dangers of our own make making, according to Professor Stephen Hawking. Uh, the risks include the birth of artificial intelligence, oh, uh, robotics, uh, nuclear war, uh, global warming. This is facts that we all are aware of, and uh, genetically engineered viruses in what uh, people uh, mistakenly call gain of function. Gain of function uh, research uh, generates viruses that do not exist of, in nature to harm other uh, humans uh, in general. And uh, they, some people are very pessimistic. They suggest that further uh, progress in science and technology can create new ways uh, where things can go uh, wrong and uh, leading to uh, a, an extinction of our technological civilization in general. Uh, assuming humanity eventually establishes colonies in other worlds, uh, it may be, uh, it would be able to serve and be able to survive. I quote here, uh, although the chance of a disaster to planet Earth in a given year may be quite low, it adds up over time and becomes a near certainty in the next thousand of 10,000 years. By that time, we should have spread out into space and to other stars. So a disaster on Earth would not mean the end of the human race. Hence, uh, expanding life to other moons and other planets uh, seems to be the destiny of our technological civilization. However, we not establish self-sustaining colonies in space for at least the next hundred years. So we have to be very careful in this period not to cause our own self-extinction. In that case, gain of function research, nuclear war, global climatic change, are uh, uh, events that we are creating uh, on our own in general. Concerning the Fermi paradox, uh, its main points uh, as formalized by other cosmologists like Michael Hart are, uh, first, there are billions of stars in the Milky Way similar to the sun. With high probability, some of these stars have Earth-like planets. I should say with high possibility, rather probability. If the Earth is typical, some may have already developed intelligent life. Some of the civilization may have developed interstellar travel. Even at the low pace of currently envisioned interstellar travel, the Milky Way galaxy would be completely traversed in a few million years. And since many of the stars uh, similar to the sun are billions of years older, this would seem to provide plenty of uh, time. All right, so space travel is a destiny of our uh, human civilization and uh, uh, some of us will get involved more in uh, that activity. So please uh, try, if you feel that you want to contribute to it, uh, try to interview with NASA or the European, European Space Agency uh, if you have interest in the uh, research and the effort in this area. Uh, in terms of the existence of life in the rest of the universe, it does not have to be similar to life on Earth, but there are some preconditions for the existing of life that is similar to ours in the rest of the universe. And uh, we know in that case that there are conditions for the existing of life. And uh, according to Wikipedia, phosphorus is essential for life. Uh, phosphates, compounds containing the phosphate ion, P, uh, P, uh, PO oxygen uh, uh, for PO43, uh, they are components of the DNA, the RNA, uh, and ATP and phospholipids. And without the existence of phosphorus, uh, you uh, people suggest that we cannot have uh, a li uh, 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 life uh, in this similar to the way that we have uh, on Earth. And uh, uh, this is a, a chromosome. Uh, and uh, you notice that the genes are on the helix form of the chromosomes. And you notice that we have uh, components of it, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and phosphorus. Some people have not uh, talked uh, 
uh, appreciably about phosphorus, but it is not just nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen that are necessary for our form of life, but also uh, phosphorus. Uh, so uh, there may be other life forms uh, that are uh, different than ours. And uh, phosphorus appears in ATP, uh, which is adenosine, adenosine triphosphate. This is the triphosphate, uh, diphosphate. You see the phosphorus atom right here, right here, and right here. These are essential for uh, having uh, life. Uh, as we know, the periodic table of the elements uh, uh, has different uh, elements uh, depending on the uh, physical phenomena in different parts of the universe. You find that there is emphasis on the production of different isotopes uh, and elements, in fact, in the periodic table of the element. According to the uh, color, uh, if uh, it's a big bang fusion, like uh, we think Earth has been formed, the hydrogen uh, uh, and the uh, 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 elements of the same kind would be predominant. Uh, in dying low mass stars, you'll find that other elements would be uh, dominant. So we should expect really depending on the formation of the uh, stars and their uh, and their uh, and their planets, uh, that we should expect different forms of uh, life. Uh, in fact, on Earth, uh, we know that there are biochemical processes that generate locally some uh, uh, different forms of life. Uh, we know that for humans, arsenic is extremely toxic; it can kill a person. But there is Mono Lake in California. Uh, that in fact has uh, arsenic eating bacteria. So that's a different form of uh, life that can exist in other parts of the universe. You can also talk about uh, 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 vents, volcanic vents at the bottom of the ocean that uh, are releasing uh, primarily sulfur and bacteria uh, use the chemical reaction there to as form of energy to survive uh, in general. So this is actually the cyanobacteria which depend on uh, arsenic, which is poisonous to humans. And it's a different form of uh, life. So there is no reason why it doesn't exist in other parts of the universe. And uh, our knowledge is coming from uh, uh, space exploration. Uh, uh, the element silicon, for instance, has been much discussed as a hypothetical alternative to carbon. So you can have a form of life depending on, uh, uh, on silicon. It has the same properties as uh, uh, carbon in terms of possibly forming different forms of uh, life. And we have to be very uh, 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 open-minded about other uh, forms of uh, life, uh, not necessarily human uh, type of uh, life. We know again, as I have said, that there are life forms at the bottom of the oceans uh, in general. So the uh, destiny of humans, uh, according to uh, the different forms of the Drake equation, is that we are going to find our uh, civilization expanding into space. Uh, if you want to expand into space, depending only on nuclear rockets, uh, makes it very, very limited. Uh, the basic uh, energy in the universe is nuclear energy uh, that we get from fusion reactions, our stars, the sun, and we get the uh, protection by, uh, of the Earth's magnetic field from the radioactivity under our feet, uh, creating the uh, dynamo effect, the magnetic field that protects the surface of our uh, Earth. So let's look at the different forms of uh, 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 propulsion that we can use to travel, not just to uh, neighboring uh, uh, celestial bodies like the moon, or Mars, but maybe to some neighboring uh, planets, uh, uh, solar systems in general. Uh, so there are many different forms where we can use nuclear energy for propulsion. Uh, one of them is, uh, what is what is designated as nuclear thermal propulsion. So how does that uh, work? Uh, uh, we can also have in contrast, a nuclear electric propulsion. Let's look first at the nuclear thermal propulsion. Uh, this would be the form of a, uh, a nuclear rocket. Uh, the core of, the, uh, of a reactor is used, maybe using graphite as a reactor core, uh, you, uh, is used to heat up a propellant. And the uh, uh, most uh, uh, interesting propellant in that case would be 
hydrogen. So you get the hydrogen from a large tank in your rocket. Uh, you pump it uh, through pumps here. You see the pumps uh, uh, into, uh, first you have to cool uh, uh, the nozzle. So you circulate a coolant to cool the nozzle. Then you inject it into the reactor core and then it expanded through a nozzle. And uh, according to Newton's law, reaction creates uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 action creates reaction and the rocket is propelled to the top right here. Now there's something interesting here. We only are using hydrogen and energy from a nuclear reactor. Chemical rockets would use hydrogen and then an oxygen. Uh, you need the oxygen, liquid oxygen and uh, uh, combine both of them to of course burn the hydrogen, uh, oxidize it in fact, and creating a steam in that case or water. Uh, that is not the case for uh, nuclear rockets. So the mass of the nuclear rocket is going to be much less, not only much less in terms of not needing, not needing the, uh, uh, the oxygen, but also in terms of the energy from uh, fission uh, is 200 million electron volt per reaction. So the size and weight of the reactor would be much, much less than if you use chemical uh, reactions uh, in general. So this is what we designate as a nuclear thermal propulsion. Another way of creating the propulsion, and uh, in fact, there have been designs of uh, such rocket uh, in, uh, shown here, for instance, in what's called the Nerva solid core rocket fuel. So that's very simple, almost like a reactor on Earth, except that uh, we are heating the hydrogen and in, uh, ejecting it from a nozzle, creating a forward motion of the uh, rocket. There is, a, uh, uh, and uh, this is another uh, view of how the core would look like. Obviously the heat generated would be so high that it would melt any metal without cooling it. So the flow before getting into the core of the reactor goes there to, like in chemical rockets, uh, to cool uh, all these uh, coils that you find around the nozzle in pictures uh, would be uh, uh, the, uh, the, cool, the uh, cryogenic, uh, uh, oxygen in that case, hydrogen in that case, uh, cooling the nozzle and then injected into the core of the reactor. Many experiments have been done along this line. And uh, some people even suggested that you can have a gaseous core uh, rocket in the sense that uh, uh, instead of having a solid core like shown in the previous diagram, you would have uh, uh, a uh, uranium, maybe a hexafluoride as a gas and you ignite that gas uh, uh, and uh, expel the fission uh, products out of uh, a nozzle. This is a, uh, a, an artist's conception of that uh, uh, approach. Another approach is uh, to use the energy from a nuclear reactor in a power conversion process where you accelerate uh, ions uh, from uh, the back here, like uh, uh, thrusters uh, that would uh, expel accelerated atoms, say, of some heavy elements like xenon, for instance, and uh, that is designated as nuclear electric propulsion. And uh, uh, some conceptual uh, design here, uh, they gave it the name uh, Prometheus as uh, the, to the, the concept, and that would be an iron thruster. They suggest that uh, uh, the, this would be the thrusters here in the back, and uh, you would propel the uh, rocket for trips. In that case, that is uh, Jupiter. And uh, you want uh, a nuclear uh, kind of uh, source of energy uh, because of the huge reduction in mass. And that is going to translate into what we are going to call the specific impulse. Uh, if in the uh, Space Odyssey uh, uh, book uh, and movies uh, written by Arthur Clarke, uh, this is a design of the spaceship. Notice that the crew uh, quarters here are positioned on a large beam. If you watch the movie or read the book, Space Oddity 2001 and so on, and you would have a shadow shield from the nuclear reactor there at the back. And uh, uh, the source is uh, Metro Golden Meyer because you may like to watch the movie about it. Uh, a third approach to uh, propulsion, nuclear propulsion, is to use uh, uh, fusion. 
And uh, in the case of fusion, you create a thermonuclear uh, plasma. Uh, you shape the shape of the plasma with magnetic coils. This would be a coil here surrounding the plasma. And then you expel uh, the plasma from the back of the rocket and provide uh, propulsion in the opposite uh, direction. So we have uh, the capability maybe of uh, using uh, fission cores, uh, fusion uh, reactions, as well as uh, uh, thrusters of uh, ions. Uh, there are experiments on Earth for how to realize this. This is an actual experiment at the University of Washington uh, for a fusion rocket experiment. They're trying to see how you can generate a plasma in that core here and then eject it out of a nozzle. Uh, the emphasis here is going to be uh, not just a trip to uh, the moon. The moon, we can reach it easily with chemical rockets, but uh, a trip to Mars uh, would take years. And uh, if uh, the mission time is years, uh, then uh, the astronauts in that case would be subjected to uh, solar uh, events and uh, uh, even uh, cosmic radiation can affect their instrumentation uh, and uh, destroy their uh, uh, instruments. Uh, so in that case, reducing the mission time becomes uh, very important. Uh, currently with chemical rockets, mission times in the years are contemplated, but with nuclear rockets, you'll see uh, that's why NASA is so much interested in that area of interest you'll find that the mission time can be uh, limited only to weeks to get there back and forth. Notice it's not only that uh, uh, space radiation can affect things and cosmic radiation can affect the instrumentation, but also uh, uh, the existence of the human body in space gets the muscle and the bone system to deteriorate. So this is a conceptual design. Look at the nozzle right here in the back of what would be a fusion rocket for a Mars uh, mission. So uh, the people at the University of Washington suggest that that experiment there could be used for a future trip to Mars. In that case, uh, uh, humans are uh, 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 yearning for uh, not just the colonization of uh, the moon, but then also Mars. Some people suggest we go directly to Mars, why the moon? But it seems that uh, the consensus or the most uh, uh, people agree that uh, 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 get, building a base on the moon will teach us how to get eventually uh, to Mars. Along this line, many different ideas have been suggested. One of them is what's called the Orion uh, project. And uh, this is uh, another form of propulsion uh, that is uh, designated as an external pulsed plasma propulsion, EPPP. And that is suggested for a Mars mission. So you'd have here basically uh, a, a space uh, that's called a four-man uh, space taxi. So this would be the uh, ship itself. At the bottom of the ship, you would have a very large plate and uh, you would have uh, a, a large magazine that contains many uh, nuclear devices, small really atomic uh, bombs. You expel them from the bottom and the explosion there would generate the shock wave that hits the bottom plates and give that in, an, in, <coughs> an impulse pro, of course, propelling the uh, rocket uh, towards Mars. In that case, you can have mission times in the range of weeks rather than uh, years, and uh, which I suggest uh, is not really uh, a meaningful way of doing it. If you use fusion energy, we suggested that the D-helium-3 reaction, deuterium plus helium-3, uh, generates a proton and an alpha particle. Both of these are charged particles. And because they're charged particles, you can use a magnetic field to direct them. And in that case, if you eject them from a nozzle, uh, you can uh, propel the rocket in the opposite uh, direction. Uh, the external uh, space propulsion process is an interesting one. It has been actually uh, tested. I'll show you some pictures of it. Uh, some people suggest we use the DT reaction, but that is not a good choice because the alpha particle gets only 20% of the energy. It is, it can be used in the, uh, in, the, in the nozzle, 
but the neutrons carry 80% of the energy from that reaction. And you'd have basically to slow them down and put in the whole thermodynamic cycle to turn their energy into maybe electrical energy for the propulsion process. Uh, these are uh, suggested nuclear propellants. Obviously, hydrogen uh, would be the, uh, the best uh, one to use. Uh, I'll show you in a moment why. Uh, helium, lithium, beryllium, <coughs> boron, carbon, nitrogen, as well as oxygen. They have different neutron absorption cross sections and can be used as the, uh, uh, in the propellant uh, process. Okay, now let us understand why is it uh, such a good idea to use uh, a nuclear uh, rocket. Uh, the description of uh, rocket parameters it depends on the, what we call the uh, impulse, uh, so specific impulse in particular. The total impulse in mechanics is the integral of the force as a function of time integrated over time, over the period in which you are applying that force from zero to T. But that is not a good description of nuclear rocketry. In nuclear rocketry or chemical rockets, in fact, it is unit mass or per ma the, divided by the mass flow rate of the rocket. So in that case, uh, uh, in rocket engine, uh, the propellant or the working fluid is carried aboard, aboard the vehicle. Uh, and accordingly, the duration of the mission is limited by the mass of the propellant carried. That's uh, very uh, obvious. And that imposes a premium on the rocket's specific impulse. So we take that impulse uh, here, integral f of t dt, and divide it into uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the propellant uh, mass flow rate, W. And uh, let me see if I have to do some admission of people here. I'll have to stop and come back. I'm sorry about that. Uh, uh, So what we are defining here the, is a specific uh, impulse where W becomes the integral of the mass flow rate of the uh, propellant. Uh, if you look at the units of the uh, uh, specific impulse, uh, it's very interesting to discover that the units uh, become uh, units of seconds. So the higher the specific impulse or impulse per unit mass uh, of the rocket, uh, the higher the acceleration of the rocket. Consider uh, a, a small car like a Beetle, a Volkswagen Beetle with a four cylinder engine compared to the Lamborghini with still 12 cylinders. Uh, you know that in that case, the, uh, the acceleration that can be attained becomes very uh, large for uh, a chemical rocket because uh, uh, for a nuclear rocket rather than a chemical rocket because the mass of the propellant uh, is going to be much uh, smaller. Uh, so far, our chemical rockets are exemplified by the Saturn rocket. It's shown here, uh, huge in size, and uh, you are uh, some kind of, uh, su it's suggested that you visit uh, 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 the Kennedy Space Center on a trip to Florida sometime. Uh, you can see the size of it. Look here at the size of that rocket using chemical propellants here. These are steady. specimen and display, I think, in somewhere in a space uh, uh, kind of uh, lab in uh, Alabama. So uh, some way travel south, maybe during the rest of the summer. Uh, and uh, uh, just you'd be amazed uh, when you watch those uh, chemical uh, rockets. So this is our state of knowledge so far, chemical rocketry, when we need to change to uh, really uh, rockets that are more or less uh, nuclear. As I suggested, the specific impulse, we can write it as uh, replace the integral of time f of t dt by f and t. This is a force uh, in Newtons. Uh, uh, the acceleration of gravity is meter per centimeter squared. And the mass flow rate is kilograms 
uh, of the fuel, kilograms per second, you'll find that Newton's is force multiplied by acceleration. So you have kilogram multiplied into uh, meters per second squared. You notice meter and meter cancel, second, second square cancel, square, square, second square cancel, kilogram and kilogram cancel, and we are left with one over a second. So the specific impulse uh, has units of seconds. And that allows us to uh, compare uh, different forms of uh, 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 propulsion for uh, different rockets uh, in general. Uh, typical uh, 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 rocket parameters for a chemical rocket is 2400 uh, uh, seconds. In that case, the units are in uh, seconds. Uh, I discuss here uh, the pro uh, properties of rockets in general, but I just want to use that uh, table to show the comparison of the characteristics of rocket propulsion systems. And I try to make the point that chemical rockets have a specific impulse of no more than 200 to 400 seconds. That's the best that you can get from liquid uh, chemical rockets. If you go to uh, nuclear rockets, look at this here, you jump, uh, one design is a Nerva core uh, from to 825 to 850 seconds. You have uh, twice the possible acceleration. Uh, a chemical rocket obviously would use hydrogen and uh, combine it with oxygen. Uh, uh, some propellants are using uh, uh, N2H4, that's uh, uh, different propellants, but uh, still you are within the range of the hundreds of seconds. You double them in a nuclear rocket almost to the level of the 1000, depending on the design. Uh, if you go to fission rockets, so you notice that uh, a nuclear liquid core, for instance, you can reach 2000 seconds as specific impulse uh, in uh, electric uh, electrostatic ion propulsion. Electric propulsion, you can get up to 25,000 uh, seconds. In magnetoplasma, we reach 15,000. Uh, in the external pulse uh, propulsion, you find that you can reach 10,000. And if you have a hybrid of fission and fusion, wow, we can reach 100,000 uh, seconds compared 100, from 100,000 here all the way down to the 200 the, to 400 uh, tiny amount that we are using from uh, today from chemical rockets. So the specific impulse is a characteristic of the use of nuclear energies uh, in general. Uh, this is not pie in the sky. There have been experiments built on Earth for the possibility of using a nuclear reactor. That's a nuclear reactor shown here. Uh, they named it Kiwi, they gave it the name Kiwi, and uh, uh, they used uh, basically hydrogen uh, and, pro and heated in the core of the reactor uh, and uh, exhausted uh, from uh, a nozzle uh, for a future uh, reactor for space propulsion. And this is the Kiwi A space reactor being tested at high power somewhere in a desert area, as you could see here. <clears throat> that would be the core of the reactor. You could see the ladder there to, for the technicians to climb up. And you could see here the exhaust from the nozzle uh, experiments carried out on Earth. The composition of the uh, Kiwi reactor is uh, shown here. Uh, you need to operate at a very high temperature. So a ni niobium carbide is a metal use. You, you, you generate very high stresses, so you have a center support, support element right here, stainless steel tie rod, and uh, the niobium uh, carbide is a coating. You use pyrolytic graphite. Graphite can take very high temperatures, and you, you, you make the system critical, circulate the hydrogen, heat it up, and then exhaust it uh, in general uh, out of the core. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, even uh, 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 experiments were conducted, uh, not just uh, for uh, space rockets, but even for in-space rockets. This is uh, a rocket experiment that was suggested to uh, fuel an airplane in, uh, in the Earth's atmosphere, uh, but it was never carried out. It has been replaced by ICBMs that are carried by nuclear submarines all over uh, the world. That was... Uh, an experiment at the Idaho National Engineering Lab there uh, at the desert of uh, Idaho.
the comparison of the solar system planets that uh, humanity would like to visit eventually is shown here. Uh, you notice that the sun is quite large in size. Uh, uh, Earth is the third planet from away from the sun. We have Mercury, a very tiny body, uh, Venus and Earth. Venus and Earth are almost of the same size. Mars is smaller than Earth. And then we get to Jupiter, which is very large in uh, size. And uh, some people uh, in the, well, in, in, we uh, inserted in the modified Drake's equation a factor uh, for Jupiter protecting the Earth when uh, astral assailants like comets or uh, asteroids uh, coming close to the Earth, the high, uh, uh, the high uh, gravitational force of Jupiter attracts those comets uh, and they fall on Jupiter rather than hitting our tiny little Earth. So that is another uh, form of uh, protection uh, for the Earth other than <coughs> the Earth's magnetic field. And uh, that may be uh, why is it that we have so far uh, survived the uh, assail, uh, astral assailants as uh, uh, some uh, mode, uh, as a mode of extinction of life on Earth. Uh, Saturn follows Jupiter, Uranus, uh, Neptune, and the tiny Pluto that some people suggest is not even a, a planet. And uh, they are discovering maybe another uh, body uh, that is uh, debated whether it's a planet uh, or uh, not. Notice that between uh, the Earth and Mars, we have uh, the near Earth uh, asteroid system, which some people think uh, has been uh, a, a planet that simply uh, disintegrated. That's in between uh, Mars and uh, the Earth. So on our way <clears throat> to Mars, uh, remember that Mars has its own moons too. So we may like also to explore the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. Uh, the main asteroid belt is beyond Mars, between Mars and Jupiter, but there are near Earth asteroids between Mars and uh, the Earth. For a trip to Mars, uh, you'll find uh, here a comparison of the chemical and nuclear systems. Uh, a nuclear systems uh, uh, launch from Earth orbit uh, to Mars would be 935,000 pounds. Whereas if you use a chemical rocket for a trip to Mars, from near Earth orbit uh, that would have a weight in pounds of 9.1 million uh, pounds. So it's a factor of 10 difference in the weight of the uh, uh, rocket. And in addition to the high uh, specific impulse, uh, this is the comparison of Mars and the Earth. <laughs> uh, you notice that uh, Earth has a di diameter of uh, 79, uh, 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 7,900 miles. Mars is almost a little uh, more than less than the diameter of uh, the Earth. Uh, the temperature range, though, uh, is uh, much lower uh, on Mars than on uh, the Earth. The gravity of the force of gravity, definitely in that case on Mars, would be less because of its smaller uh, size. Uh, so you a human would weight, weight approximately 100. Uh, if you take 100 pounds on Earth, uh, that would be equivalent to 38 pounds on Mars. So it's much less in uh, gravity in general. Uh, the day length is almost the same. So 24 hours on Earth, 24 hours and 40 minutes on Mars. Uh, the land, the people, of course, is zero on Mars. It goes without saying. And so. <laughs> We are seven billions on Earth. So people are conceptualizing uh, a Mars mission uh, and uh, the debate still is on <coughs> whether we should uh, go back first to the moon and then Mars or should we go first to uh, Mars in general. Uh, for a Mars mission being planned as well as one uh, to, uh, the, to the moon, uh, there are challenges uh, according to uh, Buzz Ald Aldrin, an astronaut, quote, the challenge ahead is epic, but historic. We are on a pathway to homestead the right red planet. And I hope that some of you here in the audience would be taking part in that epic adventure of the uh, human civilization in general. 
what are the propulsion requirements for a Mars uh, mission? Uh, obviously, the higher specific impulse of the nuclear rock rocket can reduce the mission time for a Mars mission from about a year uh, for a chemical rocket to only two to three weeks in the case of a nuclear rocket. So it, it, it's not really, uh, in my opinion, meaningful to uh, send a mission time travel of a rocket uh, in the radiation uh, environment of space, the possibility of solar eruptions destroying the instrumentation, cosmic rays, and the deterioration of the muscle and bolt system of the astronauts in, in addition to radiation, uh, that uh, a trip to Mars in two to three weeks is really uh, the only meaningful way uh, to use it. Uh, in that case, nuclear rockets, as we suggest here, hence the interest of NASA. Uh, uh, again, we go back to the external uh, pulse plasma propulsion. Uh, the suggestion so far has been to explode uh, small nuclear devices and get the impulse from the nuclear, uh, an atomic bomb, basically, fission bomb, uh, and uh, get the impulse uh, to hit a, uh, a plate. Uh, at the bottom of the rocket. But uh, so this is the way that it is uh, conceptualized. You would have a push plate at the bottom. You eject small nuclear devices and explode. <coughs> the energy generated in that case is distributed over a four pi kind of solid angle. So it goes in all directions. So a meaningful way of establishing the Orion project and uh, in fact, they designed already some of those push plates and they use chemical explosives to test the theory is to use directed kind of weapons. So that would be the Orion uh, rocket. Uh, you don't launch it from the earth. You, you launch the parts into space and then assemble them uh, in space, but they ran experiments on earth here. You could see here, uh, this is uh, the shape of one of these possible rockets, and then they explode a small chemical, chemical in that case, explosion at the bottom. And lo and behold, you could see that it works. The impulse uh, would push that possible uh, future Orion <laughs> rocket up into space. You could see it here uh, uh, rising. Uh, the way to do it in an efficient way is to direct the solid angle of the explosion. So in that case, you would use a directed type of a device. So I have uh, gone through the trouble of uh, estimating a, the geometry where you try to have a nuclear explosion right here and then direct the uh, energy uh, to hit the plate rather than going into a one over uh, four pi r square uh, solid uh, angle. So you can see that you get uh, a very large increase in the momentum that's imparted to uh, the rocket in general. And that is possible. Uh, people have been thinking about directed energy pulses. So in that case, you would have uh, an atomic bomb, a nuclear device, basically, uh, and then uh, create uh, on top a plate here that contains uh, a light element or a heavy element, uh, like a propellant. Uh, you would uh, design the shape this is with the shape to charge the nuclear device such that the energy is released only in one simple solid angle. It would evaporate that propellant that hits now uh, the bottom uh, plate of, on the Orion uh, rocket uh, in general. Uh, that, uh, that's interesting in terms of uh, the expansion of uh, gases uh, in a vacuum. And uh, uh, if you, uh, explode a, a, a charge in the sh shape of a cylinder, you'll find that it turns back into the shape of a sphere and vice versa. Uh, this is the idea of free expansion in space. So if you have that uh, plate that you evaporate in the form of a cylinder, eventually turn uh, of a, a puck, uh, eventually turn into a cylinder. If you would uh, uh, expand the cylinder in free space, it turns into a puck. So in that case, people even suggested a variable density uh, pusher uh, plate. And uh, a practical consideration is that uh, the device has to be assembled in space, not on Earth. Nevertheless, even though we have the uh, knowledge so far about uh, how to uh, build and uh, a nuclear uh, uh, rocket, 
uh, still uh, the <clears throat> the SpaceX and people are considering uh, trips to Mars, a Mars vehicle, are thinking about chemical rockets, which is, I think, a dead end uh, because of the lengths of the mission to send humans uh, to Mars. Some people suggest that, oh, they want to send humans and not give them a chance to return. And some people, in fact, have signed out for it. But a Mars uh, rocket using chemical uh, sources of energy would be larger than the size of the Saturn V rocket that took us to the moon in the Apollo uh, mission. So that's uh, SpaceX really uh, uh, designing a, a Mars vehicle. Uh, the lift off mass would be 10,500, whatever units they're using. Uh, so it's three and a half times the lift mass of the Saturn rocket used in the Apollo mission. So that would be a huge uh, jump in technology. Uh, they'll try to minimize the weight by using carbon fiber uh, uh, primary structure. And uh, the propellant would be not the uh, uh, hydrogen and oxygen used uh, by NASA in some chemical rockets, but they're using methane with oxygen. So the design of the engine here, the rocket engine is going to be uh, different. And, <laughs> and uh, in that case, they'll have to have a very large mass of that uh, uh, liquid methane as a, a fuel for the propulsion process. Uh, the uh, uh, rockets here at the bottom would be, uh, if, if it is a chemical rocket to be used uh, from SpaceX, uh, a transport vehicle would be multiple rockets at the bottom that uh, they have developed. And uh, what the innovation is, is there is to use methane as a fuel rather than uh, hydrogen in that case. Uh, they have, uh, they use a booster, uh, uh, consider boosters uh, like in the space uh, shuttle. And this is a design of their, uh, what they call the Raptor engine uh, design. Initially you use, uh, you, you, you create <laughs> a pump effect that pumps the fuel into uh, the nozzle. Uh, the chamber operates at 300 atmosphere and uh, it can, uh, it uh, basically it uses a, a process of subcooled liquid oxygen and the fuel is subcooled liquid methane. That is in contrast of using liquid hydrogen here. Uh, liquid methane is the innovation that uh, SpaceX is trying to introduce. You don't use a single engine. Uh, this is a panoply of uh, the engine with an outer ring here of 21 rocket engines, an inner ring of 14 uh, rocket engines, and the center cluster of seven uh, rocket engines. You may like to visit the site of the, uh, uh, of the, <clears throat> of the SpaceX uh, 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 corporation and see how they are envisioning a trip uh, to Mars. And that they want to reuse those rockets. They want to send the rocket, land it, and then find a way on Mars to uh, maybe if they land in an area that contains water to use, uh, dissociate the water into uh, hydrogen and oxygen and then find a way of producing methane for uh, the rocket to be returned back to Earth. So they use the concept of reusable uh, rockets. Uh, this is the transit time for MRS mission that they show us here, depending on the uh, payload. Uh, basically, they suggest that uh, the trip time would be uh, 90 days up to 115 days. So it's half a year uh, mission time, as I suggested, it could be only weeks if you use a nuclear rocket. So uh, SpaceX is advised to think about nuclear rocket. What uh, about uh, reaching some uh, nearby uh, planetary system or a star system uh, other than Earth? In 1973 nine, to 1978, the British Interplanetary Society designed a fusion a rocket in that case, and it's designated as a Daedalus uh, project. Some, uh, you can uh, read more about it, but the Daedalus project shown here, as it is moving in space, uh, it would have some propellant first uh, in those large uh, spherical tanks, but it would also uh, get uh, any, uh, uh, basically, <clears throat> Uh, collect as it is moving into space, 
uh, hydrogen atoms and uh, combine them with uh, the fuel that it is uh, uh, using here. And they are thinking about uh, uh, a spaceship that they call Icarus. Remember in Greek mythology, Icarus uh, tried to uh, fly up uh, uh, and, uh, and his father put on his hands a, a feathers that uh, were uh, molten uh, by the sun and he fell back to earth. So that's the Greek mythology, they use the name Icarus. Uh, it is real that uh, uh, a few years ago, we didn't uh, know that there are other planets in our universe. Uh, the Hubble Space for, uh, Telescope uh, was used to detect the first visible light uh, of an orb a planet orbiting another star. Since then, there are hundreds of uh, those uh, planets that were discovered. Uh, some of them are uh, suggested to be uh, in the uh, Goldilocks zone of the star system in general. Uh, beyond the trip to Mars and other parts of our solar system, uh, basically, our uh, scientists are thinking about a trip to the nearest star system to Earth, and that is Alpha Centauri. And uh, that would be may, definitely has to be a nuclear rocket, hopefully a fusion rocket in our distance uh, in general. And uh, there are two star systems that uh, uh, the Centauri system. So that is uh, uh, some kind of uh, within the realm maybe of uh, uh, future nuclear propulsion in general. Uh, there is a reactor experiment that's called the cavity reactor experiment, CRC. E. It was built in the 70s and uh, uh, hydrogen was used as a propellant. Uh, it would reach temperatures in the range of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the, uh, there, is, uh, there are developments in uh, plasma, photonic, and laser propulsion. The research is still uh, going on. There is even research on using sail propulsion that is not nuclear in that case. The, uh, the, the sun light has a pressure in space. So if you create a very large surface area, the size of a football field, uh, that can be used for propulsion from one star system to uh, another. Maybe people are uh, uh, suggesting it. This is a conceptual design even of an matter, antimatter. We know that if you uh, can get a, a positron to interact with the electron on Earth, uh, both of them annihilate into uh, electromagnetic radiation. So uh, you can have propulsion maybe using matter and antimatter. Some people have are been thinking about it. If you want to go into even more uh, interesting ideas that people are exploring is what's called the uh, warp drive engine, uh, the Albuquerque. I didn't write the name here, but it's called Albuquerque. In that case, what you try to, uh, and there are conferences, by the way, where people present their ideas in a scientific way, very seriously. Uh, they're trying to reach what uh, science fiction uh, is talking to us about uh, warp drive. What is a warp drive? Uh, a warp drive would be a spaceship that modifies the shape of the space-time continuum. So if you create a dip in the space-time continuum here in the front of the spaceship, well, the spaceship would be attracted to the front and uh, even uh, in that Albuquerque type of a design of a rocket, uh, you would uh, generate uh, also a, a, a bulge in the space-time continuum behind the spaceship. So in the front, it's a dip. In the back, it's a bulge that would propel the spaceship maybe to the nearest stars. And uh, in that case, that is left to the imagination. Uh, some uh, uh, efforts are being done on uh, using a, a space tug. In that case, it uses, a, uh, as you could see, this is a, a way of rejecting the energy. And this is an actual picture. I think it's being constructed somehow uh, in uh, Russia. This is an actual uh, picture. They call it the space uh, tug. And uh, <clears throat> they're trying to uh, build the, 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 it's a one megawatt uh, nuclear, uh, one megawatt nuclear, they call it. Uh, it's an energy module. Uh, they uh, have protective screens and radiator panels for the cooling system. This uses electric propulsion uh, ion thrusters. Uh, the, you accelerate ions, so it, it, uh, it is uh, 
uh, an interesting uh, way of uh, generating propulsion in general. All right, so to close that chapter, uh, we can say that humans are bound to biologically engineer new forms of life adapted to the vacuum of space or on the surface of frozen moons, comets, and asteroids. Uh, humans are bound to spread life, or that is our destiny to spread the life in the rest of the universe. Uh, such mobile life would free uh, for uh, our civilization would free it uh, from the planet's gravitational traps, uh, which are inhibiting its free movement in the sense that here we are on Earth uh, under the threat of any uh, without our control of uh, an astral impact by a comet or, a, uh, an, or an asteroid uh, sending us to the same fate as the uh, dinosaurs uh, 64 million years ago. We know that there was an impact that caused uh, major extinctions on Earth. So uh, we, are, we cannot control those astral impacts. So we really have to move our industrial uh, scientific uh, technological civilization into space. Uh, Freeman Dyson, uh, and as uh, a cosmologist suggests, quote, perhaps our destiny is to be the midwives to help the living universe to be born. Once life escapes from this little planet, there will be no stopping it. So we would maybe the first uh, that uh, would be able to spread life in the rest of the universe. And definitely here, uh, we cannot depend on chemical kind of uh, methods of propulsion, we need to go to nuclear uh, energy uh, in general. <clears throat> uh, all right, so I'll go here to the chat room. If there are any questions, uh, please uh, pose your question. Uh, we have time to go for another chapter uh, on the application of nuclear energy in space. All right, so uh, I go back to uh, uh, our sharing and uh, uh, since we have time, we go to another chapter. <clears throat> I have to minimize this and this. <clears throat> okay, what kind of rockets can you use uh, for uh, 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 producing space power? We talked about the general principles, uh, the concept of the specific impulse, being much larger in uh, nuclear rocketry than chemical rockets. So uh, the future of uh, humans in space will depend on uh, nuclear energy in general. Uh, NASA, as I suggested, is contemplating a lunar base uh, in what's called the NASA's Constellation Program. Uh, it will use new rockets designated as Ares-1 and Ares-5 uh, uh, launch vehicles. Uh, the <clears throat> Uh, and uh, basically uh, this could be in our future. And uh, 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 unfortunately the whole process is now being delayed by uh, the Russians and the Americans being at odds in terms of the space uh, uh, station. Uh, uh, the Russians want to build their own and I hope that they can reach some kind of accommodation depending on the war between the Russians and, and in fact, NATO and the United States. Uh, this uh, shows us a picture really of the last uh, mission, <clears throat> uh, the Apollo mission on the surface of the moon in 1972. Uh, they left there on the surface of the moon an array of different devices. Uh, as I suggested, we had six missions. Uh, this is the device that you may like to uh, see by uh, on a Tuesday uh, before the end of the summer, going to uh, Chicago, uh, maybe rent a car with your friends and visiting the uh, Museum of Science and Technology. They have a replica for of the lunar modules that landed on the moon. And this device in particular uh, is a, an isotope uh, uh, electrical production device, RTG, radioisotope thermal electric device. Uh, it was left on the surface of the moon there. You could see the flag and the uh, lunar module uh, to measure whether there were earthquakes on the surface of the moon. So let's learn a little bit about the uh, surface of the moon. Uh, it is not very well known uh, that uh, uh, 
the moon uh, uh, faces the earth on one face continuously toward the earth that is designated as it's being uh, inertially coupled to uh, the earth uh, the other side of the moon uh, on the other side is dark obviously uh, but it's fucked uh, with lots of meteorites that hit it whereas a face that is uh, continuously facing the earth is uh, more like covered has a, a sm uh, a smaller number of asteroid impacts that were uh, attracted to the moon instead of hitting the earth lucky for us and uh, in that case it's more like uh, uh, some kind of uh, basalt or uh, volcanic kind of uh, material some people suggest uh, that uh, is uh, because the moon formed as two bodies that combined with each other with the uh, higher density body on the other side of the moon so through the gravitational mv square over r, the centrifugal force, the uh, denser part of the moon is facing away from us uh, in general. Uh, you'll find that the denser smaller moon, uh, uh, the dense smaller moon uh, is uh, facing us, and another uh, more uh, dense moon combined with it, and uh, it's facing away from ours. Uh, it's very curious, uh, 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 scientific curiosity. Uh, China did send, in fact, a, a, a space probe and landed it on the opposite side of uh, the moon. So we are bound to find ourselves on the surface of the moon. Uh, these are different uh, pictures of the locations on our side where our uh, the uh, American space missions landed. This is a landing site of Apollo the 12, Apollo the 15, Apollo 17, Apollo 11. Uh, they covered a, quite a large area of the surface of the moon. So we have some good indication and knowledge about uh, the lunar uh, surface. We have interest also on Mars, uh, for, on Mars, and this is actually now the Spirit Rover uh, that was sent to Mars uh, exploring the surface of uh, Mars. So we have interest in both Mars and the moon, but it, I think uh, in my view is that uh, we'll end up building a base on the moon uh, prior to now in that case uh, a private company like SpaceX may be uh, the one that finds its way to Mars. We don't know uh, what is going to happen but uh, we wish both approaches to be successful for the sake of the uh, uh, protection of our technological civilization. Uh, Mars uh, and uh, Earth are very, very, very different. Uh, the moon we know has no atmosphere, so that is a given. So any base on the moon would have to be supplied with not just uh, uh, food supplies, but also uh, air uh, to breathe. And the suggestion is that at the uh, uh, south pole of the moon, uh, there is some ice at the bottom of some of the craters and uh, with a nuclear reactor or some solar energy electricity, that water can be dissociated into oxygen and hydrogen. Oh, these are propellants for possible chemical rockets, but the oxygen would be there uh, to provide air for uh, uh, possible astronauts. Uh, going to Mars is going to be a very, very different uh, situation. Uh, look at the different characteristics of Mars and the Earth. Uh, Earth has 78% of our atmosphere, what we breathe, as nitrogen. And 21% only is oxygen. So we breathe that mixture of uh, nitrogen and oxygen, some argon and uh, steam or uh, H2O in the air, a very tiny amount of carbon dioxide that is great worry in terms of global climatic change. Mars is on the opposite end here. It has primarily carbon dioxide as a gas uh, with some very little nitrogen, 2.7 percent, uh, little tiny oxygen, argon, and uh, no steam whatso whatsoever. On Earth, we also have O3, which is what we call the ozone uh, in parts per billion uh, per uh, volume. All right, so the atmosphere of Mars is very different than the one on Earth. And if you want oxygen for astronauts on Mars, uh, we need to find ways of uh, providing them <coughs> with oxygen, uh, mostly by dissociating water. So any base on the moon would have, must have access to some water on Mars. And in fact, the poles of Mars uh, are having some uh, frozen uh, 
either white uh, water or maybe carbon dioxide. We need to figure that out. Carbon dioxide on Mars is uh, most of the atmosphere. So uh, a colony of, of uh, humans on Earth or colonizing Mars would have to turn that carbon dioxide into some form of oxygen. So in that case, uh, uh, introducing plant life, the photosynthesis process can start turning carbon dioxide into oxygen. An interesting aspect of a base on Mars is the uh, discovery that uh, uh, that is some kind of not uh, uh, very well understood process. Some of you can take it as a PhD thesis and try to research it is that uh, the xenon isotopes abundance on Earth and Mars are very, very uh, different. You'll find that on Mars, the abundance of the xenon 129 is 1,640, I think it's parts per million, uh, compared to what is on Earth, 650. And xenon 129 uh, comes in from uh, basically the fission uh, of uh, the heavy isotopes, either uranium and thorium. So there is a mysterious situation there. What happens on Mars in the past? In fact, uh, a survey of the surface of Mars suggests that uh, near the poles, uh, there is a high concentration of the thorium as an isotope and a high concentration of potassium uh, also in the same area as there is thorium. That is some kind of a mystery that uh, scientists must uh, think about. Uh, this is uh, the Mars uh, uh, pictures, uh, uh, pictured by the Hubble Space Telescope showing us, showing us uh, fields of frozen uh, carbon dioxide and possibly water, we don't know exactly, at the poles. Uh, the missions have been always in the area where there is no uh, ice. And I suggested that there are high concentrations of thorium and potassium as well as a high concentration of the isotope xenon-139 compared to what we have uh, on Earth. So these are interesting scientific phenomena that uh, need to be investigated before we establish a base on uh, Mars. Uh, if we want to generate oxygen, obviously we have to uh, uh, find a way of evaporating the uh, water near the uh, poles, maybe new uh, using nuclear uh, devices and uh, uh, with solar radiation, you can start generating, uh, uh, in that case, uh, uh, oxygen for a possible form of life on Mars. Uh, a Mars mission uh, uh, would need a different type of a reactor than uh, what you would use on Earth. So in that case, the design would take a very interesting shape here. Uh, notice that in space, every reaction can generate uh, uh, every action generates a reaction. So we cannot use turbo machinery, rotating turbo machinery in a reactor. I'm not talking about rockets here. The last chapter was about rockets. Here we are talking about providing power to spaceships or to bases on uh, the, uh, uh, for, the, for the mission itself uh, on the travel to uh, the uh, maybe Mars. Uh, in that case, a reactor would have to think about the action reaction in space. If you rotate a spaceship in a given direction, the conservation of angular momentum would make the whole thing rotate in the opposite direction. So in that case, you have to be very careful on how to design a space reactor. Uh, this is a conceptual design of a space reactors here, a space reactor uh, that would produce uh, uh, 125 kilowatt of thermal power. And uh, to control it, you do not have control rods that come in and out because you can in insert the control rods in one direction, the whole spaceship will move in the opposite direction. So the control is achieved by rotating drums. You could see here one, two, three, four, five, six rotating drums. On one side of the rotating drum, you'll find that you have a reflecting material. So the neutrons are reflected back to the core of the reactor. Uh, on the other side, you would have absorbing material. So if you rotate a drum in this direction, you rotate the other drum in the opposite direction. So you can basically you cancel off the angular momentum and the spaceship will start not go on uh, rotating out uh, in space. Uh, the core of the reactor itself also have to be designed in such a way to minimize 
the possibility of action and reactions. Uh, in that case, you use uh, heat pipes, as it's called. So you get efficient energy to occur inside the core itself. And then I will come back to that design and uh, you extract the energy in what's called the heat pipe. Uh, this is a conceptual uh, uh, um, picture. As I suggested, the surface of the moon contains uh, a large amount of helium-3. And uh, uh, Gerald Kolsinski from the University of Wisconsin has been a pioneer suggesting that an incentive for building a base on the moon is the mining of that helium-3. And helium-3 combined with deuterium from the water in our oceans. Remember the deuterium to hydrogen ratio in our ocean on Earth is uh, 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 160 parts per million uh, can be a source of fusion energy. A single trip of a spaceship to the surface of the moon can bring in enough helium-3 to be combined with deuterium on Earth to provide all the energy needs on Earth. So here they show mining equipment, mining the surface of the moon, the dust in that case for helium-3. So that's an incentive on why uh, to build the base on uh, the moon uh, and build the base colony on the moon. There is a misconception here uh, because of the space radiation. Those astronauts would be subjected to tremendous amount of space radiation. Uh, the the uh, conceptual designers didn't think that uh, they needed to shield people ag and equipment against space radiation. Uh, the, uh, the more uh, practical way or feasible way is to build all this uh, equipment and bases under uh, the regolith or the dust of the moon to shield against space radiation or on the side of cliff, cliffs in the craters again, and then they can come in and out with a, a reduction of the space base that they can get. As I said, the reactor for uh, uh, power in space have to be different than a reactor for power on Earth. And uh, the conservation of uh, angular momentum becomes an issue uh, there. Uh, the, uh, the reactor would have a core containing fuel elements that generate fission heat, uh, the control would have those control drums at the periphery. And then the heat there is extracted by what's called the heat pipe. The heat pipe is a long pipe that contains maybe some uh, uh, material like a liquid, like sodium. And uh, in that case, the sodium evaporates and deposits its energy at the core. Uh, uh, it evaporates at the hot side inside the reactor core and then deposits its heat or rejects its heat uh, through radiation to space uh, in general. Notice here that uh, this is, uh, uh, it uses uh, beryllium uh, oxide as a structure. Beryllium uh, is, uh, uh, is, a, is an element, a light element, obviously, that has a, a, a very, uh, that has a neutron multiplication process. So it can uh, help the economy, but it also has good reflecting properties to metal. Uh, so a reflector of the uh, neutrons for the reactor core uh, itself. And uh, you use in that case elements that can take very high temperature. So you could see this is uh, uranium nitride as fuel elements. And in between six of those, you would have a heat pipe that extracts sufficient energy from the fuel pins uh, to the uh, heat pipe and then reject the heat on the outside on the cold uh, through radiation in the cold uh, in space. So the configuration would have to be very different for those types of reactors. Uh, this is the tech specs or the technical specifications of a design called the Homer 25 design. Uh, the <coughs> uh, you can see some of the interesting aspects of here, uh, the saturation temperature, uh, the heat pipe then in that case temperature is 800 and 80 in kelvins. Uh, the radiation temperature ejecting uh, and, uh, temperature to space would be 400 uh, kelvin. And in that case, the radiator must have a very large surface area, 76 uh, square meters. So after you deploy those reactors uh, on the surface of the moon, you have to uh, deploy a large area of radiator to reject heat uh, into uh, space. Uh, this uh, shows the configuration 
of the uh, fuel pills. Beryllium oxide is used as a reflector, a radial reflector around the core of the reactor. Uh, you would have cladding. You would use some boron carbide as a neutron absorber. The fuel pen would be here. And then you have the heat pipe extracting the energy from the fission process through conduction. Uh, the, uh, you, uh, what they think about is uh, using sodium, evaporated sodium inside the core, and then rejecting the heat in the heat pipe at the other end through radiation into space. And in that case, you have a heat sink. Uh, some people have even thought about using Stirling engines. Stirling engines, uh, other than the heat pipe, have, uh, uh, not, that can be designed to have not uh, many, that have no moving parts, in fact. Uh, I think there is a Swedish submarine that the Swedes have uh, uh, developed with some uh, diesel engine as a backup uh, using Stirling engine in that case are very silent. So they don't have much uh, motion. So that is also uh, suggested as a design. How do you get a heat pipe design? You get uh, uh, a center of the pipe uh, uh, using uh, a sodium vapor as a working fluid. Uh, you surround it by a wick, uh, like candles, and uh, that would be stainless steel uh, mixed with the sodium. Uh, the vapor of the sodium on one side is hot. On the other side, it rejects the heat to the environment. So uh, it, uh, uh, it heats up here. The vapor goes, rejects the heat to the environment, and then returns back uh, in the uh, outer uh, liquid annulus. So you have a liquid annulus here and the vapor annulus uh, uh, region in the center. It uses the wick action uh, in general. Uh, safety considerations, of course, a problem exists in launching those reactors into uh, space. So uh, uh, a good idea is to uh, assemble those reactors in space and design them in such a way that uh, they cannot uh, uh, lead to a controlled uh, 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 a, a chain reaction without uh, uh, being assembled together. So you build them in two uh, parts. Uh, let's uh, look at uh, how uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> Mars mission would be uh, considered. considered. Uh, it is not just uh, Mr. Elon Musk from SpaceX considering these ideas, but also Sir uh, Richard Branson, uh, who has a company version Galactica and uh, Galactica, uh, and uh, he has been giving rides uh, to the edge of space uh, to rich people who want just to have the fun uh, of doing it. And uh, NASA is also involved in uh, the Mars project. Now on Mars, uh, Mars has a very thin atmosphere, as I suggested, uh, because it has a very thin atmosphere. The radiation level here would be also very high, like. Uh, on the moon. But that uh, thin atmosphere is subject to tremendously high wind speeds in the range of the 80 to 100 miles per hour. So it's almost like hurricane winds blowing continuously on the surface of Mars, in addition to radiation from space. So using that equipment on the surface of Mars may be fine, but only temporarily. A base should be built inside the sides of hills uh, like this, uh, or, uh, uh, or <clears throat> uh, 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 craters uh, of uh, uh, impacts uh, from asteroids, or underground. Uh, uh, you cannot uh, build a base on the Mars uh, uh, in the like this picture shows here, and of the exterior. Uh, these components would be subject to continuously high winds and, uh, uh, it can, and the radiation, unless you really shield them. Uh, they suggest that they can have uh, habitats also in the shape of cylinder. That's an interior uh, design for uh, uh, an interior. That has to be either underground or on the side of cliffs uh, uh, on Mars. Notice that uh, Mars has been named the red planet because uh, in a telescope, you see a red color. Uh, of it, and uh, this is because the high winds there blow up uh, dust from the surface, and the dust contains iron oxide, which is rust in, in general, and that gives it its red color. 
uh, in a Mars mission, they'll, uh, the astronauts would have to grow their own food. So they would have uh, greenhouses. That could be, that has to be on the surface of the planet, of course, uh, to get the uh, radiation from uh, the sun for the photosynthesis uh, process. Uh, some national laboratories uh, are considering uh, the possibility of uh, uh, the use, as I suggested, of a Stirling uh, engine uh, for a mission, a mission to Mars. Uh, and they have a very funny name for it, Kilo Power. So that uh, generates uh, uh, power in the range of the kilowatts <coughs> uh, using Stirling technology. And they gave it the name Krusty. Uh, if you watch uh, the uh, cartoons of Simpson, uh, Krusty is a clown but it's a very mean clown. So I think the name uh, has not been very uh, well chosen here. Nevertheless, uh, this would be the radiator that would dissipate the heat uh, from a Stirling engine technology. Remember a Stirling engine uh, is an external uh, source of energy engine. It doesn't, it's not an internal combustion engine where you explode the working uh, fluid like the gasoline in that case. Uh, <clears throat> I think they could also use a sterling and uh, uh, they can use as fuel cells, uh, but uh, they're using the sterling uh, engine where the heating uh, comes in from a nuclear reactor. Uh, and uh, basically you, you can get uh, motion in a straight line in the engine process. So the conceptualization is that you would have those kilopower reactors uh, uh, deployed on the Mars surface. They'll have to design them again, as I said, to be subject to uh, the high winds and dust generation. And in fact, uh, they're not uh, really, uh, they're very serious about it. This is uh, a, an actual, uh, you notice that we have uh, planes here. So they're building it in a plane hangar. And uh, this is a kilopower reactor that is considered using the Stirling. Uh, cycle for deployment into space. Here is the size of it. Uh, and this is an experimental um, uh, uh, setup for that uh, reactor for space application for a base on Mars or maybe earlier on the moon. Uh, so these uh, demonstrations are going to be paving the way for future kilopower systems. Uh, we don't need the megawatts at that stage for power systems for space applications, a kilowatt power uh, kilowatt level of power is uh, adequate <clears throat> that would power human outposts on the moon and the Mars, including missions that rely on in situ resource utilization, primarily water. Uh, you dissociate the water in the hydrogen and oxygen for the oxygen, as well as uh, the combination of the uh, hydrogen oxygen uh, in a chemical space rocket. But moving to nuclear rocketry, uh, can be uh, a better choice uh, for all these different applications uh, in general. So we cover two ch chapters here on nuclear plasma space propulsion and space power propulsion. We get to the last uh, uh, chapter here is that uh, to demonstrate that in fact, uh, our civilization, technical civilization uh, is uh, uh, have a threat of impacts from uh, interstellar objects, comets, and asteroids, and I'll jump uh, here with the time that I have left to the appendix and convince you that uh, even though we don't see it every day, but the Earth is subject to a continuous impact from uh, meteorites impacts. One of them uh, shown here is called the Beringer Meteor Crater. Uh, that's uh, uh, worthwhile visiting also this summer if you rent yourself a car and head to the West Coast and then come back with your friends, visit the Yellowstone Park, like uh, uh, one of our TAs, Anchal, is uh, visiting right now. Uh, uh, this was thought to be uh, a volcanic, a, a, vol a volcano uh, uh, site, but in fact, we know now that it is uh, uh, an impact that happened, uh, a meteor crater. There is a road that uh, you can reach. Uh, from uh, uh, from the road from Arizona and the visitor center here. I think they may, you may, I don't think you can, you have to spend the whole day walking uh, around it. And it was a nickel iron meteorite that uh, was 150 feet in diameter. 
uh, it moved at a speed of 40,000 miles per hour and generated the equivalent of 20 megaton of TNT uh, equivalent. And uh, so if you travel to Arizona by the Grand Canyon, you could visit it. There are other places uh, in Quebec, Canada, you could see here, uh, this is uh, uh, another crater in Canada, 1.5 million years old. Uh, this is uh, in Labrador in Canada, another uh, crater. The craters on Earth are not uh, as visible as the craters on the moon or on Mars because of the water and wind erosion on Earth. Uh, this is another crater here, uh, Lake Manicougan uh, in Quebec. And uh, you could see that uh, uh, astral impacts have been very common. This is a very famous uh, uh, Chi, uh, Chicxulub crater that hit uh, the area of the uh, uh, in, in northern uh, Mexico, but it hit really uh, the ocean that is thought to be uh, the one that uh, caused the extinction of the uh, dinosaurs in general. And uh, Chicxulub uh, means the tale of the devil in Mayan uh, language. Another uh, crater here, uh, uh, in fact, you can go uh, uh, on Google Earth and discover some craters maybe. Uh, and give them the name that you like, Lake uh, Botsumsi uh, in Ghana and so on. So the earth is subject to astral impacts, either comets, another one uh, in Chad, uh, people keep discovering them by exploring the uh, Google uh, earth uh, in general. All right, how much energy uh, can uh, such a, uh, an impact from a, an asteroid uh, generate on earth? So I'll just, uh, 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 suggest that uh, you may like to read the rest of the chapter, but I'll concentrate on uh, the, uh, a calculation of how much energy can be carried by those asteroids. The Tunguska phenomenon, other than the Barrigan crater, happened about uh, 110 uh, years ago uh, in Siberia, so it doesn't affect the, the rate of the Earth but you can be walking in a desert area and you can find the meteorite there on the surface. So the question is how much energy can a meteorite carry? And uh, we'll close our uh, uh, chapter today along uh, this line. Uh, actually, there is uh, an observation of a meteorite hitting the surface of Jupiter right here. Uh, and uh, it, it is a reality. Uh, they are all around the Earth. They can hit us at any time without our even knowing that they are there. This is a picture take, taken of the Grand Teton uh, Mountain uh, uh, close to Idaho Falls uh, to the interest of uh, Anchal here. You could see that the Grand Teton, you should go up that mountain uh, on a weekend for a visit. And uh, uh, lately the chicks, uh, uh, a meteorite at Chelyabinsk hit a city uh, in uh, Russia that was in our lifetime. You can read also about it, but what I want to do is uh, uh, figure out how much energy any of those meteorites would uh, carry and carry on an example along this line. The risk of impacting objects uh, from uh, space, whether it's a, 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 a comet or, uh, or a, a <clears throat> an asteroid in general uh, is inversely proportional to its yield, meaning that if the yield is very large, the frequency of occurrence is very low. Now, the question is how much energy that mass either of an asteroid, metallic in fact, uh, like it's uh, Shebyalinsk, uh, or is it uh, uh, in the shape of uh, maybe uh, uh, ice? Uh, the energy, kinetic energy is such is so large that as it gets into the atmosphere, it can evaporate and then explode. But how much energy is released is definitely the kinetic energy of the asteroid. So let's take the case of uh, an asteroid, the shape uh, of the asteroid that held, uh, hit Chepialinsk in Russia a few years ago. Uh, it uh, was two, uh, if you have a, a, an asteroid that's uh, uh, about 200 meters in diameter, and uh, let's take, uh, uh, in that case, the radius would be 100 meters, so the volume as a sphere would be four R cubed divided into three. So that would be 4 million uh, cubic meter. If it's just a hundred, 
a 200 meter diameter uh, or 100 meter air radius. The question is how much energy would it carry? The mass is going to be the volume that we calculated a moment ago multiplied into the density. Uh, the density uh, can vary between one and 3.5 gram per centimeter cube. So that's nine billion kilograms. Now uh, uh, get that uh, M here uh, in the kinetic energy equation or the yield in that case of the energy release multiplied into the speed square of the, uh, of the, uh, of the asteroid or the comet. So you find that the yield uh, would be 3.77, 10 to the 18th June, joules. If you go back to our first chapter, the uh, equivalence between a TNT, a kiloton of TNT explosive uh, in, in ergs and joules was 4.2, 10 to the 12 joule. So the yield, if you take that uh, uh, joules divide into the kiloton of TNT, you'll find that uh, a meteorite the size of 100 meters in radius can generate energy in the range of 890 megaton. Imagine uh, at these high speeds, the energy release from an impact of a meteorite. The, ever, the largest ever explosion on Earth of a nuclear device was a 50 megaton of TNT equivalent uh, designated as the Tsar Bomba that the Russians exploded in Siberia. So in that case, uh, uh, these meteorites uh, are a cause of uh, huge fatalities if they uh, hit the earth and uh, uh, they can basically cause uh, world population extinction. And they did cause the extinction of the dinosaur a long time ago. So I'll just uh, conclude uh, our chapter here by suggesting that uh, uh, humanity has to think about uh, 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 astral impacts, astral from st the stars, uh, uh, protection against them by different methods and uh, uh, definitely uh, escaping the confines of the Earth by having uh, bases uh, on uh, other planets and on the moon. And I'll leave you uh, uh, here uh, by uh, simply uh, closing uh, the lecture. I'll go back to the chat room for any uh, questions. And thank you for your attention. And I hope that you can all is uh, the test uh, in that case. Any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, Alvaro and Anshal, could you please, uh, once the assignments are turned in, today's lecture would be included in the final, included in the final. Uh, please send me a copy of the uh, Excel worksheet so that I can grade the final exam. Uh, uh, Pranav Banerjee, uh, to answer you, uh, it will be the same format as the previous two tests. Yeah, I'll give you 24 hours. Any other questions? I can uh, unmute anybody that needs to be unmuted. Maybe uh, you can unmute yourself now uh, if you want to talk. And, uh, let's go here. You can even share a screen if you want. Sorry. I have a, I have a concern, a quick concern about um, sure. the um, so I just realized that I accidentally made the mistake of emailing them to your Illinois email address instead of the Gmail uh, email address. Uh oh, that's um, a second midterm. Uh, yeah. Can you please uh, stop the recording?